worry about it. I suppose the police and the National Guard and all of that uh, law enforcement was able to bring things under control. And then at some point you realize, as, as, I'm sure as a, as a young gang member or as a young person or whoever it was driving, would realize, okay, we, we, we better not go back on these people today. You, you can't do this. They're going to lock us up. Thanks, Chico, with one of the key businesses that run from Well, I often put a sign in the window that said, so, brother. There were a couple other places that did the same thing after a while, too. And it didn't protect all the businesses. Uh, but we were certainly spared during this entire ordeal. There was not even a threat. Those folks that hung out here during the time, and sometimes they're standing outside because April was nice weather, and someone would say, you know, man, you know, we, we need to get that cash register. And they'd say, no, no, don't, don't touch Ben. Ben's at our place, don't touch Ben. And what was the soul brother sign meant to represent? Well, it represented black. It represented African American. The fact that we were in the African American home business. And was there any sympathy at all? I didn't feel sympathetic because I felt that this was, it didn't prove anything. This didn't, uh, this wasn't what Dr. Martin was talking about. This very peaceful man. Trying to do his peace. He was 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 trying to do his peace. I think it just frustrated folks to know anyone who just did this with no one. When the riots were over, 39 people were dead, more than 2,600 injured, and 21,000 people have been arrested. Although the riots were triggered by the assassination of Dr. King, Virginia Alley believes there were about even more than that. Some people said, well, that's the kind of brought everybody together, but it was happening across the country, and they were uh, certainly uh, trying to send a message that we have been mistreated long enough. It was time for something to be done. It's the first time anything has happened here. So many cities took part in this thing. So many people in these cities took part. And the message was, it's time to bring equality to all people. It's not fair what happened all these years. But so do you think that message was not? You know, we've made some progress. We still have a ways to go in terms of education and stuff. But we made some progress in terms of racial relations. I was thinking, I'm hoping, I think we did. I certainly didn't think in my lifetime we'd have a black president. Not only did we have one, but he was re-elected. Uh, I think we have to call that progress. Virginia Alley was talking to Fahama Haida, and that subject was one which particularly piqued your interest. Let me draw your attention to the excellent black history section that we have on our website. You'll find a wealth of first-hand witness accounts of events charting the struggle for equal rights, not just in the U.S., in South Africa, Australia, and elsewhere. Just search for BBC News. Post-colonial African politics in the 1970s. Next, without doubt, one of the most prominent figures from that period was Idi Amin, Uganda's brutal dictator, whose eight years of rule left his country demoralized, divided, and diminished on the international stage. Eventually, Tanzanian troops invaded Uganda and ousted Amin. His downfall marked the end of a six-month conflict between the two countries, which had been triggered by Amin's ill-fated invasion of northern Tanzania. Alex Lutz reports. It's April 1979, and the Tanzanian army is marching on the Ugandan capital, Kampala. <laughs> Six months earlier, Ugandan brutal dictator Idi Amin had sent his forces to invade and occupy a chunk of northern Tanzania. There had been skirmishes between the two countries before. Tanzania had long been a base for the Ugandan opposition and was home to the former Ugandan president, Milton Obote, who had been overthrown by Idi Amin. In response to the invasion, the Tanzanian